Let's pray. God, I love what Johnny just said in terms of wanting to hear clearly from you. Because we do want to hear from you. You should be the loudest voice in our life. Your whisper should be the one voice that we want to hear and the one that counts. <clears throat> so as we open your word right now, we want to do the courageous thing and open our minds and our hearts to hear what it is you want to say to us how you want to lead us, how you want to guide us. And so we ask you to do that so that we can follow you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I want you to imagine something that's happening today in every church in America. Every church in America has the same kind of thing happening. There is a minivan that drives up and right behind, and as you see the people get out of it, you notice three people. Paula, Randy, and Simon. Who are Paula, Randy, and Simon? The former host of what? American Idol. Probably the most popular host that have ever, have ever been on that show. You remember Paula, she was sweet. Randy called everybody dog. And Simon, well, Simon was Simon. And we kind of put up with him every week as he critiqued everybody and he had this no holes barred kind of approach, right? So they sit in church everywhere around the nation. And when church is over, they get back in their minivan and they drive away. Simon, of course, is driving. Randy is in the back, still calling everybody dog. And Paula is driving or riding shotgun. And Paula innocently asks, what did you think of church today? And then it starts. They critique every song. Everybody who was performing in the worship team or the choir. They begin to critique the announcements. They begin to critique how long things went. And finally, they get around to the pastor and they critique everything. They don't talk about what he talked about or the content necessarily. They critique his style, how long he went, whether or not he looked at his watch. You do know what it means when a pastor looks at his watch, don't you, when he's talking? Absolutely nothing. And, um, and so... On it goes, and every week it happens. Every week, there's a critique of what happens. Here's what's missed in that. And if you're here at the beginning of the, of the service, you heard Mark as he, as he talks, and Mark, Mark just has scripture that flows out of him. And Mark has an invitation, and the invitation isn't from Mark. The invitation is really for God. You see, this is God's service. And there's only one in the audience. It's God. So when we critique the choir, guess who's the choir? We are. And God is the only one in the audience. I once had a guy at my former congregation come up to me after the service and said, Roger, you know what? We sing the same old songs week after week. Oh, can't we do something new? Can't we do something this or something that? It's the same old songs. And what caught me was I kind of felt the same thing when he, when he said that. You know, or, or I, I felt that during the service. And, but when he said it, all of a sudden I got a new image that God was with Gabriel and Michael and God had turned to them and said, oh, look it, they're singing my favorite songs with that same old attitude. You see, we are the choir. We are the ones who are supposed to bring our best on a Sunday. And not only Sunday, but Monday through Saturday as well. 
And the church of Jesus Christ is the only organization in the world that exists not for the satisfaction of its members. We exist to bring glory to God. Not for God to bring us pleasure and not for God to make us happy. And so I want to keep that in mind that we are the ones that bring our best. So when we sing the final song today, let's remember, we're the choir. We're the ones that realize that God is in the audience, and we bring our best to him. And you say, well, I don't sing very well. God gave you his voice, your voice. He knows if you sing on key or not. Somehow I think it, it translates differently when it gets to heaven, and we're all on key, believe it or not. But don't worry, I won't break into song because I could clear this place. So I just want to keep that in mind. Last week we talked about what is the actual purpose, vision, and mission of a church. And we talked about the fact that there's a danger of having double vision in a congregation. What I mean by double vision, it's possible for God to have a vision for us, And for us to miss it and create our own vision, which creates double vision and things get blurry and get confusing. But it's not important to hear what my vision is, or even the lead pastor. It's most important to hear what God's vision, what God's purpose, and what God's mission is for a congregation. So if you missed last Sunday... Let me do a quick recap. Purpose. Purpose is why does a congregation exist? We would complete the sentence, Fremont Community Church exists in order to what? And we went as far as to say that Jesus says, I have brought you glory, speaking to God, on earth by finishing the work that you gave me to do. So what we said was, it's simple to say that the purpose of a church congregation is to glorify God by doing the work that he gives us to do in its city and its surrounding community and all around the world. So let me personalize that. The purpose for Fremont Community Church is to glorify God by doing the work that he gives us to do in Fremont, in Newark, in Union City, in our surrounding community, and all around the world. That's why we exist. We exist for God's, to fulfill God's purpose. Then we said vision. Vision is a compelling, inspiring, and challenging picture of the future. And I said I had a hard time finding Jesus' vision in Matthew, in Mark, in Luke, or in John. And I got very frustrated because I'm old enough to remember an old movie. And some of you will remember this. And and if you've never seen this movie, I would encourage you to to see it. It's funny. uh, It's entertaining. Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, starring Robert Redford and Paul Newman. And they are, uh, Butch Cassidy led a band of, robbers called the, um, oh, now all of a sudden it it, uh, escaped me, the the hole-in-the-wall gang. And uh, they are robbing banks, just Butch and Sundance, and Butch comes out with a new plan. They're going to move to Bolivia. And Sundance says to him, you keep doing the thinking, Butch. That's what you're best at. And Butch Cassidy says, kid, I see the world through binoculars. Everybody else wears bifocals. That's vision. When you see everything through binoculars and everybody else wears bifocals, that's vision. And I thought, if Butch Cassidy has a vision, Jesus must have had a vision. And like I said last week, I should have known the answer is always in the back of the book. And we found it in the book of Revelation Jesus says this, John is writing, and he said, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, 
For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city in New Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old things, order of things has passed away. Jesus said, behold, I am making everything new. Can you imagine what heaven's going to be like? What paradise is going to be like? That eventually one day we're going to spend time because of what Jesus did for us when he went to the cross. He who knew knew no sin became sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God. Mark quoted that passage earlier. That it will be a place that there's no death. There's no crying or pain. There's no mourning. There's no sadness. There's no hunger. There's no disease. That's a place where we're headed. So you might say the vision of a church congregation can be said to see a day where all who belong to Jesus will spend eternity with him in heaven and they're going to take as many people with them as possible. That should be our vision. We one day see a time when we're going to spend eternity in this place called paradise and we're going to take as many people with us as possible. Wow. But last week I kept saying over and over again that I was going to spend more time this week talking about mission. What is mission? Are you with me so far? Everybody caught up? Good, thank you. I love it when somebody says yes. I get fearful when there's a lot of people who go, "Uh uh-uh, we're kind of confused. Okay. So I want to show you this gentleman on the screen has been a friend of mine for nearly 50 years. His name is Lon Allison. We met when he was a senior in high school and I was a sophomore at UC Berkeley. And we started working in youth ministry when I was 20 and he was 18. And uh, I spent a Memorial Day weekend the next year with our youth swimming for 72 hours straight to raise enough money to hire him as my assistant. You know, Lon, um, Lon was a pretty good first hire for me. He later became the executive director of the Billy Graham Center for Evangelism at Wheaton Campus. I said my first hire was my best hire. It went downhill from there. Last October, I had the honor, the very sad honor, of speaking at Lon's memorial when he passed away. I was there at Wheaton uh, Bible Church, a historic church, Their first Sunday when they started 80 years ago, 85 years ago, they sent out 10 missionaries that they ordained that day for the mission field. And they have sent missionaries all around the world. And here's Lon was leading this group, and I had several opportunities to be with him and his team working as a consultant and as a coach with them. And uh, one of my greatest uh, privileges was being with them for a two-day retreat or a three-day retreat one time, we were talking about their vision and their mission and their purpose. We had taken about a half-hour break, and Lon had gone in to take a 15-minute power nap. And when Lon took a 15-minute power nap, he came back, and he was always very uh, refreshed. And that day, he came back, and he said, Raj, you say that vision should be a picture of the future. He says, I think I know what our picture is what an inspiring, compelling, challenging picture of the future for the Graham Center. And I said, what that, what's that, Lon? And he said, I envision the pearly gates of heaven. And just outside the gates, there's a sign that reads, caution, under construction. 
because we're creating a housing shortage in heaven. Now that's a vision. That's a vision. Just a few years later, Lon was the co-chair of the Lausanne Evangelism Conference that had hundreds of thousands of evangelists that gathered all around the world and their vision really was to create a housing shortage in heaven. Because Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you. Wouldn't it be great? So it would look something like this. There's the pearly gates and there's the tractor outside with under construction. So how do we create mission from this? And what is mission? Mission is the road one takes and the action you perform in order to fulfill your purpose and achieve your vision. It's what you do on, a, on an everyday basis. What are you doing? You might say that the church has been commissioned by Jesus. What, have we, what did Jesus call it or what do we call it? We call it the great commission. We've been commissioned with him. Now everybody, when, when we talk about the great commission being our mission, Everybody thinks that's found at the end of the Gospel of Matthew. But what I want to show you is, is that the mission of Jesus is much more multifaceted than that. In fact, the Great Commission appears in every Gospel in different forms and in the book of Acts. So let's read it first in Matthew. In Matthew is the goal of the Great Commission. And it says this, Jesus said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. That's our mission. Our mission, the goal of the Great Commission is to make disciples of all nations. But when the Bible talks about nations, it's much more, it's much broader than we think of nations. Nations are people groups. And there are literally thousands of people groups in the world in fact, at the last count, there was over 6,000 people groups in the world that have still never heard the gospel of Jesus. However, people tell me that really concentrate on this, by the year 2025, every people group in the world will have heard the gospel of Jesus. In our lifetime, we're going to see the Great Commission actually fulfilled. That's good news. But you see, the goal is go and make disciples of all nations. How are we supposed to do that? Well, Mark tells us what the methodology of the Great Commission is. In the Gospel of Mark, Jesus says, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. How do we fulfill the Great Commission? How do we reach every nation? It's to proclaim the gospel. The gospel is the methodology, the good news. You know, when I was with the Graham Center and this team, they, they, were, they were very intimidating. They were the smartest group of, of people I'd ever worked with. But they were warm and kind and and uh, so welcoming. But they, there was one thing that really bothered them, and they, were, they talked about it that whole weekend. They talked about the fact that there was a quote that really bothered them. The quote was, was said to have been said by St. Francis of Assisi. Maybe you've heard it. He's attributed with saying, always be ready to share the gospel, and when you must, use words. Have you ever heard that? Always be ready to share the gospel. And when you must, use words. The problem is, these scholars with the Graham Center said, we've searched 
to try and find where St. Francis actually said that. And the closest we can come is that that quote comes up about 200 years after St. Francis lived. So it's impossible for him to have said it because it never shows up until two, over 200 years after he lived. And Lon said, it doesn't make sense anyway. What do you mean, always be prepared to share the gospel and when you must use words? He goes, that's like saying, always be ready to feed hungry people and when you must, use food. Right? Oh, be ready to feed hungry people and when you must, use food. Our lives, no matter how good they are, are never going to replace the words of the good news. The good news have to be said with words. My life is never going to be so good that people are going to look at me and go, oh, I realize I'm a sinner, separated from God. Jesus came and died for me, rose three days later, and if I pray and ask Jesus into my life, oh, I get it now just by watching me. That's not going to happen. So the methodology, the, the method that we use is that we preach the gospel. Well, what is the gospel? I'm glad you asked, because Luke has an answer. We go to Luke. This is how the, the Great Commission is shared in Luke. He opened their minds so they could understand the scripture. That's Jesus. And Jesus told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day and repentance of, for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning in Jerusalem. What's the good news? Jesus came, suffered, and died on the cross. That he rose again on the third day, and repentance for the forgiveness of sin will be preached in his name. And then look at what else he says. You are witnesses of these things. I'm going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. That's how Luke shares the Great Commission. And with Luke, we see the message that's the method of fulfilling the Great Commission. What's the model? John tells us what the model is. In John 20, 21, Jesus said, Peace be with you, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. The model is that we are sent out to our local communities, our surrounding communities, and all around the world. Somebody said one time that, that as Gabriel and Michael and the angels were watching Jesus with the 12 apostles. They were just amazed in terms of that was going to be the start of a movement in which reaching all the nations. And Gabriel said to God, well, if that's your plan A and those 12 guys don't work out, what's your plan B? And somebody said, God said at that point, there is no plan B. And I think later on now, as, as the angels look and they see that the mission has been passed on to, now to you and to me, and they say, wow, that group now? Now what's your plan B? And God still says, there is no plan B. It's you and me. We're still the ones being sent. So you see... The goal of the Great Commission is to reach every nation. The method is to proclaim the gospel. The gospel is that Jesus died on the cross, rose again three days later, and that forgiveness of sins comes in his name. And the method is for you and I to be the messengers. But there's a strategy, and we see the strategy in the book of Acts. In Acts we see, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you 
and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Let me rephrase that or paraphrase that. Fremont Community Church, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Fremont and in all of Newark and Union City and to the ends of the earth. Is this making sense now? I mean, this whole thing about vision, this whole thing about purpose, this whole thing about, about mission is so clear. It's so clear. But it's just a little daunting. And a lot of times people, people look at me and go, but you know what, I, boy, I, I wish I could do that. But you know what, really? I, I, I'm, I'm just too young. Or I'm just too old. Or I don't know enough. Or I, I, I don't have any abilities. Or I don't have any gifts. I don't, I don't have anything to bring. I don't have anything to offer. Everybody else can do that, but, but I, I can't do that. Who, who, who am I to think that I can be a part of this great movement? Because you see, we're not called just to come to church on Sunday and receive. We're called to be a part of a movement. A movement. A friend of mine, Doug Stevens, and I once went to a Young Life retreat for pastors. And there... The guy that was speaking that weekend shared one story that I'll never forget. He said, the church started as a movement in Jerusalem. And when it went to Judea and Samaria and to Antioch, it became a mission. And then it came to Italy and we turned it into a mausoleum or a monastery. And then it went to Europe and we turned it into a museum. And it's come to America and we've turned it into a monument. We know how to move and, and take a mission or a movement and turn it into a monument. Our challenge is can we take a monument and turn it back into a movement? We are supposed to be a part of a movement not just gathering on Sunday. We have a great challenge. And so let me tell you, I only have two more stories and we'll be done. Let me to tell you the story of the butterfly effect with a guy by the name of Dr. Edwin Lorenz. It seems that he was a professor of meteorology at MIT, where he got his bachelor and his master's in meteorology. And in the 60s, uh, he started his research and the head of the department at MIT. And he was looking to see if he could find ways of measuring patterns in weather and what impacted weather around the world. And one of the findings that he came up with was called the chaos theory, and another one was called the butterfly effect. And the butterfly effect, in essence, says this, that it's possible that the flap of a butterfly's wings in Beijing, China, can have an impact on a hurricane in the coast of North Carolina just a few days later. Do you believe that? Well, according to this expert, that was his finding, and it's been codified now in science as the butterfly effect. The flap of the butterfly wings. Do this with me. Look at the person next to you and say, you look pretty good doing that. <laughs> Come on, tell them. You look pretty good doing that. Flap of the butterfly wings in China, impacting a hurricane in North Carolina. Whoa. Hard to believe, but it's true. 
And when I read that years ago, I thought, you know why that's true? It's biblical. You see, until then, science was under the impression that a big effect had a big cause. And nothing that's, that's monumental starts off small. It has a big cause, a big beginning, a big bang. But now, Lorenz had shown, no, sometimes a seemingly insignificant action can have an incredible effect. Well, think about it like this. Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put, and he watched crowds putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts, but a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a few cents. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, Wow, did you see that? Holy cow, did you see? Well, he might not have said holy cow. But did you, did you see what? Did you see what she did? Did you, catch, did you catch that? He didn't say anything about that when rich people put money in, but when this widow put in a few cents. Well, let me say what he actually said. Truly, I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They all gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all that she had to live on. Jesus said, did you see that? It's the flap of a butterfly's wings. Or let's catch him in John chapter 6. In John chapter 6, it's a story that he has been preaching all day and teaching all day to a crowd of 5,000 men. And they didn't count the women and the children, so the crowd probably about 20,000 people. And at the end of the day, the disciples are concerned. You can't send them home for a long journey hungry. And Jesus said, give them something to eat. And they said, we don't have anything. We, I mean, it'd be how, how much... How much wages would it take to feed this crowd? So we pick it up. One of the disciples that was Andrew, brother to Simon Peter, said, there's a little boy here who has a happy meal. He has five barley loaves and two fish. But that's a drop in the bucket for a crowd like this. And Jesus said, make the people sit down. And there was a nice carpet of green grass in this place. They sat down, about 5,000 of them. That's just the men. Then Jesus took the bread and having given thanks, gave it to those who were seated. He did the same with the fish. All ate as much as they wanted. When the people had eaten their fill, he said to the disciples, gather the leftovers so nothing is wasted. They went to work and filled 12 large baskets with leftovers from the five barley loaves. Do this again. Another butterfly flapped its wings. In fact, Jesus goes on to say something like this. He says, if anyone even gives a cup of cold water to one of these little ones, a child, who is my disciple, truly I tell you, that person will certainly not lose their reward. Or in the Gospel of Mark, he says, truly I tell you, anyone who gives you a cup of cold water in my name, because you belong to the Messiah, will certainly not lose their reward. That sounds insignificant, doesn't it? A cup of cold water? Because Jesus knows small acts of kindness can change somebody's day or somebody's life. You say you have nothing to, to bring do you have two pennies? Do you have nothing to bring? you ever have a happy meal? you have nothing to give? Do you have a cup of cold water? All it takes is the flap of a butterfly's wings. So let me tell you the last story. It's the story of a man by the name of Edward Kimball. 
You may never have heard of Edward Kimball. Most people never have. It's very rare that I've ever talked to anybody that knows this name, Edward Kimball. And oftentimes when somebody says, yeah, I know who Edward Kimball was, and they tell me, nope, that wasn't the Edward Kimball I'm talking about. Edward Kimball lived in the 19th century, the 1800s. And he was a pretty nondescript butterfly. Not a real butterfly. But all he did was teach a Sunday school class of young men. And one day he decided that he wanted to talk to every single one of the young men in his class because he wanted to make certain that they all knew who Jesus was. So he took the time of beginning to meet with each one of them. And one day... He was going to go talk to this 15-year-old kid in his class. And he sat outside where the kid worked. The, the kid wasn't the brightest crayon in the drawer. He, he wasn't the sharpest kid in the group. And the only kind of job he could get was stocking shoes in the back of a shoe store. But Edward Kimball was so nervous that he sat outside and prayed because he said, God, I... I really want this kid to know who Jesus is. And he finally got enough courage and he went in to talk to him. And he kind of bumbled his way through the gospel as best he could. And the kid kind of bumbled his way through that and they prayed at the end. And it says that Edward Kimball left feeling so defeated because he didn't think the kid really understood. And he felt like such a failure. And the kid twice tried to join the church, but the elder said, we don't think you get it. We don't think you really understand. But that kid later saved enough money and came to America where he became an evangelist. Now, this is a name that many of you will recognize because that kid was Dwight Moody. And Dwight Moody was one of the great evangelists of his time. When he was here in America, he spoke at a church that had a school that was invited by a pastor who had several doctorates and was very proud of his intellect. And he was not moved at all by how Moody shared the gospel. He was not moved at all by, by uh, the fact that Moody only had a fifth grade education. And he pretty much dismissed Moody, I mean, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, Dwight Moody, and um, this pastor whose name was Frederick Brotherton Meyer, F.B. Meyer, wasn't moved at all until one of the teachers in the school came to him and said, you know, every single one of my girls received Jesus because of Moody. And that shook Meyer to his core, and he re-examined his faith, and he said, you know what, I may be a pastor, but I'm not even a Christian. And Meyer became a Christian. And later on, uh, as he was preaching, another man that, again, you may not know this name, but his name was J. Wilbur Chapman, and he came to Meyer afterwards, and he said, I'm not sure I'm a Christian, even though I'm a pastor. Meyer helped him examine his faith. He rededicated his life to Christ. Chapman became an evangelist. He took on an associate, a, uh, a kid that he would mentor, who uh, had been a former Major League Baseball player by the name of Billy Sunday. If you look up Billy Sunday's stats, you will wonder how he ever stayed in the Major Leagues for nine years, but he did. And uh, he became a world-class evangelist, and he went to North Carolina and he gave a crusade. There was a group of business people that were there at that crusade, and they said, you know what, we want to do this again. And in 1934, they did another crusade and they asked someone to come and do that crusade, and his name, catch this, his name was Mordecai Ham. 
How many counseling sessions do you think it is to have a name Mordecai? But Mordecai Ham did this crusade in North Carolina. And there were three teenage kids that came. And by the end of the crusade, each of them had gone forward, one, including one who was 16 years old, lanky kid, who ended up then graduating from high school and went to this obscure Bible college in Florida and later transferred to Wheaton College, the same college that I shared with you earlier, where the Billy Graham Center of Evangelism resides. That 16-year-old kid you have heard of. His name is Billy Graham. By the time Dr. Graham passed away, he had preached the gospel to 2.2 billion people. And remember, this didn't start with Mordecai Ham. This didn't start with Billy Sunday. This didn't start with J. Wilbur Chapman. This didn't start with F.B. Meyer. This didn't start with Dwight Moody. Who did it start with? The little butterfly, Edward Kimball. You think you have nothing to bring to the table. You think you have nothing to share. You think you have nothing to give. Do me a favor. Flap your wings again. Come on. Flap your wings again. Some of you are not trying because you're doing this. <laughs> when you do this, you only go around in circles. You see, you're not too young. You're not too old. I mean, what, what, I mean when people say, I'm too young, and then later they say, I'm too, what's the perfect age? You know, 38 through 42. If you're 37, you're too young. If you're 43, you're too old. You know, so you're sitting there saying, catch me in that five-year window, 38, 39, 40, 41, 42. That's perfect age. No, you're not too young. You're not too old. You're not under-resourced. You're not too poor. You have a part to play in the Great Commission. So flap your wings like the pterodactyl you are. Not a butterfly. Edward Kimball turned out to be a pterodactyl. And how did he start? He went in to this 15-year-old kid feeling and left feeling like a failure. And yet, in his lineage, 2.2 billion people. You never know when the life you begin to impact or the life you begin to change by one small world, by one small act, becomes the next Billy Graham. So I'm going to ask the worship team to come back. Remember, we're the choir. So as they lead us, we're the choir to bring our best. I'm going to ask the elders to come forward. And I'm going to ask if you have a desire to become a part of a movement. Not someone who receives, but someone who gives. I want you to come and ask for prayer in terms of saying, God, use me. Use me to change my world. Amen?